so last night some of us got together and we thought hey you know what let's not go for the fake news panel at all because then it will be obvious that the announcement of a fake news panel was fake news so kind of meta commentary but here we are uh, you know one of the books which influenced me as a journalist and would you know uh, most of you would have read it is a book uh, which was released uh, 100 years ago by Walter Lippmann called public opinion and the first chapter of that book public opinion is called the world outside and the pictures in our heads and lipman's essential premise which is you know uh, kind of almost obvious enough by now is that all of us uh, all of us look look at the world by constructing narratives in our heads which may or may not confirm conform with the um, a world as it actually is and and this is really a process exacerbated today uh, by uh, technology and so on so so my question for all the panelists therefore is that you know we often think of fake news as in there are, here are some bad actors maybe it's somebody's it cell or whoever and they are spreading fake news and all of that but isn't the crux of the problem that there is actually an organic demand for such fake news i don't think there's an organic demand for misinformation uh it is just that uh, if you look at the misinformation that usually circulates it is very provocative and uh, you know people getting killed there are multiple videos that we have debunked you know somebody getting murdered in brazil somebody getting murdered in mexico and it is being claimed ki you know hindu is killing muslim or muslim is killing hindu all the narratives are very very provocative and that is what makes people share it more it is not that they want it it mm. is uh, 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 those who are put out, putting out misinformation they very well understand how the social dynamics of the country and it is not that misinformation is uh, is the same in every country misinformation the nature of misinformation changes from one country to another for example if you go to uh, uh, let's say you know thailand etc there's much more medical misinformation there than political misinformation so uh, it depends on from country to country their political situation because right now what we are battling mainly two kinds in india is political misinformation medical misinformation medical misinformation is much more difficult to tackle so let's let's not even go there but political misinformation is very very closely connected with what's happening in the country the political story of the country and there's a an organized industry which is putting out putting it out knowing exactly exactly well what impact it will have so uh, you know there's a, a well known mit study that was released last year which said that uh, fake news is 70% more likely to be retweeted based on a study exhaustive study that they did over time and they also said that true stories are likely to take 6 times longer to reach uh, a certain set of people and i think they had a sample of 1500 people for that part so uh, fake news is just fun it's more uh, nice to consume if you were to break that up a little further uh, it, it, you know so one is the political hate and all of that and you send it because you want other people to resonate with you for whatever reason but there's a lot of feel good stuff right so you'll have a let's say there's a photograph of nirmala sitaraman standing with a young uh, uh, air force cadet or air force pilot uh, girl oh uh, here is mother and daughter and you know uh, uh, nirmala sitaraman's daughter and how uh it you know it's a great thing that you have a minister of defense and her daughter is also so it just feel good right so no one wants to or will clarify that this could be fake or false but just forwards it blindly uh you know we have uh, we have a, a, a lunar mission going on right now uh, just last week there were images uh, which were released saying that oh here are five images beautiful images of the earth taken by chandrayaan now obviously you want to believe it and it fits with the narrative and then you forward it fake uh, uh, there are there are many more examples in the medical space and which is where it gets far more tricky and dangerous for instance uh, you know put coconut oil and you won't get dengue you know have uh, eat papaya leaf uh, uh, and you know again you won't get dengue so now in some of these cases there is a very very small uh, element of truth in it because there may be some nutritional contribution of papaya leaf to fighting uh, dengue or uh, but it surely cannot prevent and for that you need to go to a proper doctor and take normal medicines so and and there are other examples like that so the, it could be something that's feel good and therefore you want to share it with your friends and family which is what you usually do on whatsapp it could be because of a concerted architected designed push which is what prateek also talked about and uh, it could be uh, in other cases where you really fear for something you fear that uh, a bank is going to get uh, uh, raided you know as in there's going to be a run on the bank and you're going to tell uh, i'm going to tell amit and uh, santosh that you know pull your money out of punjab national bank because nirav modi has run away with a billion dollars you know i mean i mean this is stuff that happened here before last so uh, and it's fear concern so i think it's about four or five emotions which drive it but the net impact is obviously quite dangerous so manisha i mean uh, 
for the media then is there i mean given the fact that your incentives are also tailored around having your stories read mm-hmm. doing stories that people are interested in if fake news does seem to attract more clicks and more attention uh, does it then push you towards um, privileging the sensational over the everyday no actually i have a slightly different take to this and building from what govin said about the fun element of it i always wonder when i go back home why is it that my family or my parents or my relatives are more excited about like a fake news whatsapp thing than my piece or some other journalistic piece that i'll say why don't you read this and ha ha pad lenge but they're more excited about this you know whatsapp image or a, a message and i think that over time there's something to think about for all news professionals over a period of time journalists a lot of journalism today is just unreadable we don't write for our readers anymore we write for our peers we write for the ministry that we cover we want to look intelligent among our sort of peer group or the people that the beats that we go to the bureaucrat or the politician and we're just simply not talking to our readers when it comes to just clarifying an issue or simplicity of language not using jargons or really addressing our readers concern i think the one thing to learn from fake news if you can say is just this here's a product that completely caters to you talks to you in your language in in very simple ways it's horrible and it's evil but maybe journalists also need to start uh, simplifying what they do demystifying their work and also simplify the stuff that they write for and and really uh, cater to their audience Dr. Sareen, I'll turn to you here, and it's kind of apt that we have a psychiatrist on the panel. Um, but, uh, why do people, even if they don't want to believe fake news, let's say even if there isn't organic demand for it, they are still more susceptible to it than they otherwise, uh, than, you know, why is that? W- w- what drives us towards? So I think uh, maybe we perhaps need to, <clears throat> you know, just step back a little bit here and uh, look at it in a slightly different perspective. You know, uh, very often we tend to think of this as a modern phenomena, as something that is happening now. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that that isn't particularly true. Uh, misinformation, uh, what we call fake news, uh, is is something that has always been around. What has changed is the uh, fluency or facility with which technology uh, you know helps spread it but the in essence this is something that has always been there and fake news is something that you know it's a classic example of where the uh, the extremes sort of tend to define uh, the rest of it so so the the periphery in a sense defines the center uh, all everything that is misinformation or that gets uh tweeted retweeted falana dimkana is as as pointed out not necessarily a uh, malintent the third problem is that news uh is partly reporting and partly opinion and the question as to which part of the opinion comes in and whether i am uh, whether i like that opinion or whether it is in keeping with my opinion or not will then determine as to whether you know the same thing about the construction of narrative it's like uh, our pharmacology textbooks right in you know 40 years ago uh, used to say how do you define an alcoholic and the answer is very simple an alcoholic is anybody who drinks whom you don't like <laughs> so any any news that i am not is fake news is fake news you know so donald trump will see some bits as fake news i will see some bits as fake news you will see some bits as fake news uh but what is happening again is that that uh that the the, the periphery is then defining the margin so essentially what we have to do is to figure out the the construction of this narrative uh sensationalism will sell uh sensationalism will get uh i mean that's why it is in uh, that's why it's sensationalistic you know that's uh when I mean, that's what sensation is all about people will seek sensation and that's not going to change in a big hurry so perhaps these are things that we need to figure out to begin with 
Santosh, when uh, you know I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, all of us got our news from a free mono from from a few monolithic sources. You had the Times of India coming every day to your house or whatever, and there was a broad consensus on what the truth is. And that's changed now. We get all our information and our knowledge from this entirely dispersed sources. And you wrote a great column touching on these sort of. Um, uh, uh, th this phenomenon where you've spoken about how over the centuries we have, quote, successfully built institutions that help manufacture collective trust, stop quote. And uh, you, you've you spoken about how what you see happening today is a breakdown of those institutions and that collective trust. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. No, so essentially, you know, this the, the very idea of, of something being labeled the news, you know, it used to be the news brought to you by so and so, which is actually a hell of a conceit if you think about it, the idea of your being able to sum up the world in these very definitive kind of this idea of the news as this single monolithic construction. But I think it was an important part, I think, of several institutions that built trust for themselves by creating an elaborate you know, cultural system. So the, the news system, for instance, if you look at the newspaper, it, it, it uses devices like symmetry, it uses the idea of the editor. If you look at how it is laid out, there is the headline and the all of these are creating sense. If you look at the names, you know, they are the Herald and the, you know, the Times of, India, Times of India, which is a, a hell of a thing to be able to say, right? Mm -hmm. Which is you represent India and, 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 and the Times of India, right? Mm -hmm. And you look at most, most newspapers or they will carry these kind of, they, they have names of that kind and they construct this, this almost self-validating kind of an authority. Television news, you know, you look at the, the, the signature that comes before a news. It's, and then the person in earlier days, of course, when, when they gave the news still, sits formally, dressed formally, and news is a visitation from the ether virtually, you know. It kind of materializes and they kind of become the medium uh, for the news. You, so these are constructed ideas. What has happened over time is that as we have started dismantling the, the apparent naturalness of these constructions and saying, but actually, who is bringing me the news? And so, for instance, even I think a report that was, you know, that I think uh, yesterday was, was I think uh, I read about the idea of saying the gender composition of, of editorial team or the cast composition. These are all ways in which we are legitimately asking questions of saying news is not just a, a sort of a natural manifestation. It has been constructed. The moment we are, the consequence of something like that is that we start, therefore, being able to dismantle the authority of news. And once you start dismantling the authority of, of any institution, judiciary, where does the judge come from, what caste is the judge, you know, etc., you, the, the sort of the illusion that we had created of authority and order starts coming apart. Once it com comes apart, how do you put it back together? And I think that's what we are finding when it comes to fake news today, is that you are willing to believe, you know, any narrative that suits you, right? Because it, what, what matters is who brings you the news. If NDTV has said it, then I can dismiss it if I am a, a certain kind of, a, I have a certain point of view. I don't need to focus on the news, but on who brings it to me. And eventually, if you ask really the fundamental question is, why do we need the truth? I mean, what is so important? <laughs> we construct our own self images on lies, you know, on a bundle of lies that we tell about ourselves. What is so profoundly important about the truth? You know, what is so profoundly important? You. If I can believe that Nirmala Sita Raman and, and the, was, that was her daughter and that made me feel good, it doesn't affect me in any dramatic way. You know, if, if I can believe in a narrative that supports, you know, my political position, why, I mean, the cost of believing that is low and the benefit it gives me is high. So, so again, there is a natural incentive, I think, to, to uh, sort of, uh, <laughs> fake news has, has fertile ground in that sense. I think that truth may be a lofty word and a journalist's job is to achieve a certain clarity. And I think there's immense value in that. We can't, I mean, I don't think it's like, why do we need clarity? So, and what misinformation and fake news does is just muddy the waters, right? So I, I wouldn't agree that, I mean, I, I do think it's terribly dangerous to, so maybe truth, yeah, maybe truth is just, yeah, we all journalists like to tell ourselves that, oh, we are, you know, speaking truth to power and we're in pursuit of truth and all, but maybe at the heart of it, it's really clarity, right? An issue. 
and a certain clarity towards your reader and towards your audience. Well, I mean, we, I think we shouldn't, however, make the mistake of conflating fake news and mainstream media. I mean, mainstream media in itself is not a real source of fake news. I mean, yeah, maybe a few oh, bad actors. No, no, it is. But I think in percentage terms, I mean, if you look at your, uh, you know, just to be fair, I mean, if you look at your daily WhatsApp inbox, I mean, 95% of it will come from sources that you have no clue. Uh, including stuff which is manufactured and distributed and as Santosh nicely said, it just makes you feel good. You know, you know when you point out to his point, you know, say, that, but Nirmala says that, that, is, that is not mother and daughter, they say, no, no, but it looks nice, you know. So it just feels good, so, you know, and therefore does the truth really matter? And I think there's, I think there's also a distinction to be made here between truth and facts. You know, truth is a lofty term, but what a journalist can do is while they may or may not have access to the truth, they can report the facts as accurately as they can. I'll, I'll turn to Pratik here. Now, one inflection point which you pointed out in one of your interviews was 2016, when one geo comes in and makes data and bandwidth easily available, cheap Chinese smartphones, um, you know, search through the Indian market, and you pointed that out, out as an inflection point. I'd like you, I'd like you to talk a little bit about your journey with Alt News. What was the impetus behind it? Why did you feel this was necessary? And how did you see this whole ecosystem evolve rapidly? Because 2016 is like yesterday. So much has happened in so short a span of time, especially for someone as old as me. So tell me a little bit about your. Uh, I think Boom and Alt News started pretty much at the same time. Boom started right after demonetization, November 2016, while we started in February 2017. I think the reasons are pretty much similar that uh, I believe that, you know, uh, I, sp I spend a lot of time on social media and, you know, that has been the case since 2013, 2012. And uh, we seriously saw a lot of uh, these videos and images coming and, you know, with uh, false narratives. And uh, we saw a bunch of websites uh, like Postcard News, etc. Now they have gone down because you know the guy got arrested, and now every website wala is a little scared, you know, because. Uh, but it, but as far as WhatsApp etc is concerned, it was just increasing, and so why we started at that point of time because, uh, and it was from a position of fear actually because you know there, at that point of time we used to see these videos, you know, very violent videos, and uh, frankly I did not at that point of time I did not have much of an understanding as far as you know what impact it can have. Uh, you know there was always this fear that look. This this video is going to lead to a riot. You know, eventually what happened was these child kidnapping rumors, which became much more lethal. But when we started, it was basically from the fear that, you know, if, because uh, as software engineer, the, the core team that started Alt News, none of us were journalists. So, you know, as people from the tech industry, we could find out uh, with very simple digital tools, what is the fact corresponding to a video and image? And we thought it's necessary to put it out because at that point of time, we thought that if we don't do this, this is going to lead to another riot. So that is how we started. And, and was it sort of frustrating for you that falsehood can spread so fast and like wildfire, but the truth is really hard to get out there? Um, no, that is not the frustration. The frustration is uh, with multiple tech companies. You know, okay. um, uh, this this is a product of frustration. That is, I have gone to several forums and said, you know, there's a tech out there, you can detect copyright violations, right? That is, you have a video and you put another video, you can detect copyright violation. Similarly, if there's something which is, a video which is circulating. Now the story of the video remains the same, right? Whether it's a, whatever context it circulates in, the story of the video remains the same. So essentially what we need is a system which ties a story to a video. And uh, and whenever anybody comes up with an image or comes across an image or video on social media, find a way to tell the story behind it. You know, that is that is what we are trying to do. And automate it. So, you know, this expansion of misinformation ha wouldn't have happened if tech companies would have stepped in and, you know, taken these measures long, long ago. There's, there's a lot of automation that can be done, you know, at various levels. Not everything can be automated. Finally, you need a human mind to figure out, you know, these are the facts of an image or video. But uh, a lot can be done which I think will be very effective as solutions in terms of curbing misinformation. But uh, unfortunately, nothing has been done till now. So, if I may, uh, you might want to sort of uh, break down, uh, sorry, you might want to break down that last, uh, you know, question a little bit. The, the fact that some news will spread faster, uh, we understand. Uh, and not necessarily just the dangerous bit, uh, the, the, in a sense, the affect-laden 
uh, news will actually spread faster, uh, both positively and negatively affect Leighton. Okay, and and this is you know like I said has always been true. What technology has done is to ease the fluency of that. So the two parts of this are one. Uh, the sort of the the beguiling road that Santosh uh, has taken us down. Ki, uh, kya farak padta? Uh, uh, what what is truth in any case? And the other, uh, which is uh, what technology is doing to both this and human responsiveness. You know. Is it affecting uh, reaction times? Is it reaction patterns? Is it because of the anonymity? Is it affecting uh, the the tone, texture, tenor of my responsivity? Uh, which, because of that technology, uh, is is morphing into different uh, ways, is perhaps something that I think we need to. Uh, be able to figure out uh, better. I, I think Santosh's rhetorical question was a lament and not a statement of his position. Uh, Govind, you wanted to say something? No, I, I think, you know, it, this is a big debate, right? Uh, what, what, do, what role do technology companies play? Uh, what can they do more proactively? I mean, you can take two positions. One is that they have no clue what they're doing and this is a wild animal on the loose. The other is that they created something which perhaps the power of which they've not fully been able to understand themselves. And the question I would further pose is, are they responding as effectively or efficiently as they should, given new developments that are happening? And to me, actually, the answer is more yes than no. And I'll give you an example. Uh, we had an attack on a, in a mosque uh, in Christchurch, New Zealand, right? And this was amazing because the attacker was wearing a helmet cam and was streaming uh, the whole uh, episode live on his uh, Facebook account and as he was shooting down people. We were getting, uh, you know, on our helpline forward saying that this can't, this cannot be true, but can you please check? You know, usually people say this, uh, you know, this is fake, so please check. So people are obviously re somewhere realizing that this looks so true and yet hoping that it's not true. So at, at that time, uh, there was one video, uh, one video being uploaded every second on some platform, YouTube, Facebook, and so on. So none of them were obviously prepared for it. And that, and that video went viral, and it was seen, and it continues to be seen, despite uh, what the tech companies say, and to some extent I agree, making a huge amount of effort to pull it down. What has happened subsequently, and, and this I, I, I know a little bit more from the Google YouTube side, is that today when there's an event that happens, they actually set up something called an incident commander. Right? So no longer is a technology platform in that sense playing completely mute spectator. So when the Notre Dame fire happened, uh, as, as, I as I understand, YouTube had an incident commander and they were actually scanning uh, authoritative news sources in four or five continents to ensure that only the right news sources were being surfaced. So this is to me is a response. And I think this is what we should be actively looking out for and watching. I mean, are the technology companies responding to what is happening and what is changing and are they responding fast enough? And at all points of time, it's important to keep up the pressure. And uh, Manisha, to you know, come back to the media's role in this, um, do you guys set up systems and processes in place which you know uh, play a proactive role in combating uh, fake news, not just in, in your own kind of reporting and journalism, but in what you see? And also, uh, does fake news become an issue for you only when a piece of uh, fake news really breaks and you know causes lynchings or whatever, and then obviously you have to do a story on it? Or do you also think about ways to combat it before those things happen? Uh, so I'll just come to your question, but I just wanted to add to one point about uh, the truth uh, the uh, falsehood spreading faster than truth. And I, I think that's true, that may be true for stories, but the issue of trust, uh, there have been studies, I think again it was an MIT study that said that both Republican and Democrats believe that hyper-partisan websites like Breitbart were not to be trusted. In India we had a study where I think it was Reuters or BBC that said that even a BJP supporter trusted NDTV.com more than Op India. This was, okay, I, I hope this, I, I just didn't peddle fake news on this, but I'll check it. <laughs> but no, I remember reading this really well that even BJP supporters trusted NDTV.com and... Sounds very dubious so, to me. So, so I'm saying, I think that we're getting, news professionals are getting a nice kick in their ass where they've been told that, okay, you're not, you know, you have not been transparent with your methods, you have not really catered to our news needs. Uh, so you're not going to be the king, like Santosh said, you're not the guys who are going to tell us what the truth is and we can go elsewhere. But I think that 
much depends now on how we react to this because the implicit trust, I don't think people are still losing trust in mainstream media organizations. When it comes to news laundry, um, a lot of our work is actually critiquing the mainstream media. So for us, a lot of the times we are fact-checking fake news is stuff that we've seen on television channels. And like, I remember when the Balakot strikes happened, there was this big thing about this big terrorist being sh killed in the strikes. And everyone, all channels, literally every channel, put it out. And it turned out it just wasn't true. So our, a lot of our fact-checking, so like uh, Pratik and Govind would do more of WhatsApp and stuff like that. A lot of our fact-checking is actually stuff that we see on mainstream news. So, yeah. So after Pulwama boom, I mean, in, in that one week after Pulwama, we uh, debunked something like 30 very viral posts uh, on uh, broad social media and uh, mainstream media. 30, I mean, just after Pulwama. And, and that, of course, uh, also brought to light how uh, when there is, uh, let's say, design at work, uh, how things can, the, I mean, so, uh, the distribution can accelerate so rapidly. So, so let's kind of talk about uh, solutions now. What are the different things that we in civil society or perhaps with the state do to solve this problem of uh, fake news? At one level, if people are consuming it, it seems almost patronizing to call it a problem because, hey, they're consuming it willingly, but leaving that broader philosophical point aside because it does matter. Um, uh, what Pratik has tried with the Alt News app, obviously, is a technology solution on his own. And I'm sure the technology uh, companies, Facebook, Google and all, are also trying to do various um, interventions on that. For example, now when you uh, forward a message from WhatsApp, it says for forwarded the registered watermark, little things like that. To what extent do you think technology can solve this problem? Um, I think tech has a huge role. Um, the simple thing, you know, most of the misinformation comes on uh, on your phones, uh, there's, you're not going to open your laptop, transfer it, do a Google reverse image search. Nobody's going to do that. Why has it taken such a long time to just bring a Google reverse image search for mobile phones? You know, uh, I mean, something. It, it is not going to tell you the answer that this is true, this is false. But that is the first thing that that should have been done. So uh, there is a lot that tech can be done, and very very simple tech. What we what we are using is something called perceptual hashing. This is a thing which has been there for a very long time. Uh, with deep learning, machine learning, the tech has gone so fast. I mean, you put an image on somebody puts your image on Facebook, and they tell you, look, somebody has uploaded your picture. Mm. Right, so, so tech has gone very, very far, and the sort of issue that we have—not everything can be solved, but there are large sections of it which, uh, which can be curbed to a large extent using tech. It cannot all of it cannot be automated, but the portions which need to be automated have not been automated. Uh, so I, I think tech is actually limited in its, uh, I mean it has a role but I think it's limited because the people who create and particularly those who create uh, deliberately uh, for some profit uh, do it with increasing ingenuity and uh, and therefore it becomes that much more difficult for a machine of any sort to even catch it at a, at a late filter, forget an early filter. Uh, our position is that uh, we have to educate people. We have to educate people uh, at, at, I mean, there are two kinds because most forwards on your WhatsApp come from your 60 year old uncle or aunt sometimes, but mostly it's uncles. Uh, so therefore you have to educate at the top, which is far more difficult. But where you can focus on and perhaps with some uh, measurable uh, impact is children. And you have to educate children on not just about fake news and uh, misinformation, but about using the internet itself. Right? So how do you use the internet? How do you not jump to Wikipedia to check something because it's not an original source? Uh, how do you use the internet in a way that it supplements some other form of core reading or researching as, as a kid? How do you uh, use the internet so you don't uh, jump to it for, let's say, some because you've got a slight uh, catch in your back or uh, a pain in the head? Uh, because what it'll tell you most likely is that you've got cancer or tumor. Right? So uh, and and so therefore it's about media literacy, at, but it's also, as I think, as, as I look ahead, it's about media wisdom and at, at a very early age. Uh, we run classes in, uh, we've been mostly doing it in Bombay, but we've, uh, we're running classes for, uh, which are like three-hour training sessions pro bono uh, in several schools in Bombay now, and we're finding very, very good response. This is, I mean, we've not scaled up, nor I don't know whether we will, but I think, uh, and the other countries are doing it. Finland has done it very admirably at scale. So training, teaching, making people aware of the internet itself, leading to wisdom or media wisdom, I think is the way to go. I have a small point to make. So, you know, I just want to take the Wikipedia example. And yes, it's important to tell kids that Wikipedia should not be a first source of information. But uh, what has made Wikipedia the first source of information? You type anything. 
what is the first search result? Wikipedia, right? So uh, till the time there is, you know, there are n because that if, if that is the first search result in your head, you think that that is the most authoritative source. So unless you solve, you, yes, we can educate people, but uh, again, I'm going back to this. This is not something that can be solved, you know, Everything needs to be done. This is a huge problem. Yes, we need to educate people, uh, you know. But let's say if Google keeps throwing you Wikipedia, if they can't figure out, you know, how to rank based on, uh, you know, the information itself and Wikipedia's default sort of thing, then people will keep going back to Wikipedia. And Wikipedia, we have seen how many times it has been defaced. I mean, for example, you know that uh, the time, uh, you know, when when the Modi thing came on time and the hello, yeah, so. Uh, you know, Time Magazine came up with the article before uh, election and immediately the author's thing was defaced. And people took screenshots and kept circulating it. Uh, there were multiple edits and it took a long time for, for the Wikipedia editors to actually lock down Wikipedia, that particular page. But, but if you look for the author's name, the first thing is the Wikipedia page. So whatever information will be there, they'll think that, you know, what was written is that he is a Congress rep or something like that. And that becomes authoritative. So that, that is where tech has to come into picture and figure out things. That, that's a very interesting um, sort of hypothetical test case also because people use Wikipedia so much because the utility is enormous and normally they, of course, have their citations and all that. So it's a trustworthy source also for a reason. But I can see what you're saying that if you could build into to your search engine weightage is something that also accounts for accuracy, then that would certainly help. You're kind of running out of time. We have two, uh, five minutes to go before the Q&A. So I'd also then like to um, uh, commit to you, Santosh, with uh, you know another of the solutions that is often proposed, which of course those who know me will know I oppose wholeheartedly, is, is government regulation. What are sort of your views on that? I mean, my sense always is that a so social problems can only largely be solved by society, that the state only makes things worse. What's your view? No, I'm, I mean, I think it's a, it's a difficult question in this case. And I, I don't know about government regulation specifically, but I, you know, the, the fact that a lot of the technology companies certainly have the kind of power that they themselves hadn't bargained for and do not fully understand. And, and if you think about it, I mean, you think about the whole idea of freedom of expression, uh, however much it has been exalted, that in operation, actually, uh, the freedom of expression was extremely limited. I mean, you know, you had a very channelized sort of institutions that controlled information. So news media were all were institutional sort of control over, over information. And if you were to look at the, how democratic it was, it was barely, I mean, you have three letters to the editor on a daily basis, right, in a newspaper. You have, what were the sources in which, you know, the, the general kind of population could voice its opinions? Democracy, once in five years you vote. So, I mean, the idea of democracy, the idea of the fact that everyone has a voice was actually channelized very, very, in a very regulated and a restrained kind of a manner. Suddenly what has happened is this absolute opening out where everyone has a voice, and everyone not only has a voice, but as Alok said, it gets you know immediately and 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 widely redistributed uh, globally. I don't think our social systems are have have been geared to handle this. So what we are talking about is technology evolving at a rate and and creating an imbalance that that is so far ahead of our social and administrative systems to cope with that we are having this vast gulf. And now it is one thing to say that let it resolve itself and let, let sort of, you know, therefore this particular sort of thing prevail. But in the absence of a social ability to adapt systems, what else do you do? But to at least have a certain other accelerated form of, of ordering, uh, which, which tries to at least to some extent align the two rates of evolution. Uh, so that I willingly see uh, no option, but, but at least through the technology companies to say, you must take greater responsibility. Because it is something that you may not have bargained for, but this is now something you have created and you must help uh, at least mitigate uh, the effects of this. So Einstein once rather famously said that you, you know, you can't use the same sort of thinking uh, to solve the problem which you have created. Okay. So looking for technological solutions to technologically created uh, problems is always going to be limited. 
You have to think beyond that. You have to figure out that what the technology has done is changed uh, response patterns, social behaviors, and those can only be fixed by those larger understandings and conversations. In this, of course, technology will play a role. But is that going to be the fulcrum on which this rests? Perhaps not. Getting technology companies to take responsibility will be a function of civil society. In that sense, in answer to your question, my my sense is that getting governments to take responsibility will also be uh, on the push of civil society. Because clearly, it is civil society which has to push all the stakeholders into doing this. Now, the, if, but the, the trouble is that even as I say this, I mean, it seems... Uh, so far-fetched. Mr. Amit Shah is listening to every word of yours. Give him more power. <laughs> it seems, seems even more far-fetched. <laughs> Absolutely. But the only way is conversation. So I actually completely agree with what Govind is saying. You know, uh, that that is the only way to talk to people. Uh, uh, responsibility. Uh, and and hopefully that change will come about. In fact, I noticed your eyebrows going up and Govind said something about 60-year-old WhatsApp uncles. But... <laughs> We'll cut to the audience for a Q&A now. Any questions? Uh, uh, and I must clarify the uh, Indie TV Op India bit is from Reuters study. I didn't make up something on a fake news panel. Oh, she's very, been Googling. Very, yeah, I've been frantically. Yeah, but it's a, it's a Reuters study. We can agree on the sample size or the methodology, but it's a study. I'm waiting I think for we the need more alt of that. news piece on that Reuters piece. <laughs> <laughs> this doesn't end here. Uh, that gentleman in the middle. Hi. Um, um, my question is, so I hear that uh, you say that um, you believe tech companies are actually doing quite some to curtail this fake news. Um, however, from a pure user perspective, when I see Twitter, when I see Facebook, I see the likes of Madhupur Nimakishwar or Tarek Fata still maintaining their verified status, although they peddle fake news like multiple times during a day. And there are very easy solutions that I can think of in my head, but I see like it's very counterintuitive that this tech platforms are not doing that. Like, why not take away someone's verified status? Or why not, like, mark a certain post as fake news the way WhatsApp marks posts so There's this guy called Donald, uh, what's his name, who'll go off Twitter first, if that were to be implemented. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so I don't see, uh, like, from a purely user perspective, you guys are the experts, but from a purely user perspective, I don't see tech doing enough to curtail fake news and the way it spreads, especially from these notes where fa the famous personalities where fake news spreads from. Why do you think tech is not doing enough? Is it government pressure? Is there other uh, incentives for these big tech companies to not do enough on this because it provides them traffic? What sure. is any, the any, anyone expert would like opinion? to answer? Yeah. It? Yeah. I mean, I, I can take a quick stab at it. I think, uh, you know, as I've understood it, you, you know, most of most tech companies are from California, and it's a it's a very different libertarian uh, capitalism approach to things uh, and freedom of speech, expression, and all of that. And I think it's 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 those values which obviously don't work uh, everywhere in the world. And I think what we're seeing is the is the tension as both sides or them versus many sides battle it out, right? So a China can say that I'm going to shut that whole thing out completely and not allow anyone to enter. Uh, a democracy like India has to obviously and has allowed them to enter, but now has to grapple with what happens when you know there's or America itself. Uh, Donald Trump has lied about ten thousand times uh, till date. Uh, I think at, at the point that uh, Washington Post did a first study, I think he was lying about four times a day. Then it went up <laughs> after that. Uh, after they reported it, he actually went up. So, uh, so where do you start and, and where do you uh, end? But I think this is a, it's a tension point, but we have to make sure that we keep the pressure up, as I said, on the uh, technology platforms and ensure that they're responsive to what is changing, whether it's our uh, way of thinking, our way of life, or when it comes to countries, our, our uh, social and political structures. Quick. Um, so, for example, you know, there was this uh, uh, sort of network of bots, et cetera, from Iran operating, uh, putting out a lot of misinformation, targeting US. They took, took that down. But if we recognize the same thing in India, it's not going to go down. So there's also 
um, they are not looking beyond you know what is affecting us they are, they have not realized what is happening here you know this child kidnapping rumors etc so there's also a bit of hypocrisy on their part that you know they are sort of very the, the focus is very narrow uh, the the lady out there can someone hand her a mic please Hi, so this is something that all of you have touched on briefly, but I want to call it out largely as the elephant in the room, which is the politics that drives fake, fake news in our country. And um, I want to just flesh this out a little bit, uh, and you can correct me if what I'm saying is fake or partly fake or wholly fake. Um, the, the people that power this massive engine that is putting fake news out in droves, if we tackle it through tech, we're not actually tackling the intent or their ability to gen then generate 50 million more such pieces of fake news when you take down 10 million, or 5 million, or two, two pieces, or the time it takes. So we're always going to try to play catch up. But what if we actually tackle this through political advocacy instead of just a tech solution where I'm giving you a concrete example. The person who apparently put his money into running the first sort of um, interface between politics and social media in this country that we saw blow up, which was up, then uh, was apparently disenchanted with the Ahmadmi Party, put that same money into powering the, 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 the present regime, the BJP's uh, apparatus of pushing these factories or, or their allies, pushing out these factories of, um, of fake news. Uh, and it, I hear that this person is apparently disenchanted. So if we pick up the people who are acting, putting their money, setting up these fake news rooms and pushing this out into the social media space and actually interacting with them, m guilting them, making them say, look, you've got blood on your hands, can you sleep? Uh, if we actually tackle the politics behind this, will we have a better success rate? Because we tend to have amnesia about the connection between our own pol political choices, our politics, and fake news. But yes. you have a question to add to yes, that? No, okay. I have a question to add to that. Just coming back to the technology part. I have worked in a global technology company, a giant, for seven years. And I have seen the if a company or a national player is in 60 countries, it's not possible for them to alter their community guidelines uh, to suit every single one of those countries. That's not a question. Yes. But uh, why are, I mean, you know, you're shying away from the possibility, like she says, that, that all the players have a responsibility. You can't just say that the you know, technology companies are not, not doing enough. That is not true. Look at Google's AI project, Pitgardia. But many, many other things you will know. So why can't it be a concerted effort between political activists, media, tech companies, uh, government? Uh, it's very, very easy to sit, sit here and say that Yes, they are not acting. I think Govind made that point that they are doing a fair bit and they're working together yes, with some people. I think the lady in orange would like to add a point. Sorry, I wasn't actually suggesting that the responsibility pass back to each user and away from Facebook and Twitter at all. They are complicit as the, as, as the villains of the piece, in my opinion. I am saying the government is equally complicit and we need to call that out loudly and use political advocacy to take that down and the actors that have powered this financially. I'm being very specific and very different from what she's saying. It's not an extension of what I'm saying. Just I, I, Okay, let me, let me this thing. I think, uh, you know, uh, I, I was speaking at a consumer goods company had invited me to speak on this phenomenon of misinformation. And after that, uh, this uh, gentleman came up to me and said, uh, Oh, you know, I think I've really, uh, this is a very interesting presentation and our talk and uh, I think uh, I think there's a great uh, business model in fake news. Oh, I said that's great because we have, we've not figured out how to, uh, you know, fund this whole thing. He says, no, no, what I mean is by creating fake news. <laughs> you know? so, so, so I think that's really the problem. I mean, there is monetary incentive on the other side and there isn't. And I don't think there's one political party, if at all, that's more complicit than the others. Everyone is in the game today in varying degrees, uh, shapes and sizes, maybe driven by their uh, net worth, but everyone is in the game. And I think how they can be stopped or not stopped is a slightly different discussion, which is why I, when I look at the situation today, I would rather focus on the demand side than the supply side. I agree, and also as far as the politics is concerned, like firstly, uh, what Pratik does at Alt News is he busts news from um, uh, pretty much all the parties and all the sides. That said, I would agree with you that by and large, what is happening is driven by 
um, uh, the, the, the ruling party. But the thing is, what political advocacy? We've tried that, we failed. They won overwhelmingly in 2019. So that political advocacy is over. We still try to do it in limited ways. But, you know, uh, for the moment, we have kind of uh, lost that game. And as for guilting people, come on now. You want to guilt these people? <laughs> Sorry, last, very last question. Uh, I have a question. Very brief, very yeah, very brief. quick question. Yeah. I'll get to it. So, <clears throat> so uh, it's no as statement question mark has to be. It's as simple end. as the fact that we have democratized the way we communicate, the way we get our messages out there, and we exercise our democratic power. That is fair, right? Now, equally, why shouldn't there be a way for us to? get involved in you know auditing or getting involved in looking at what is fake and what is not each platform instead of employing 10000 people which a lot of the likes of facebook and google are doing to check what is fake and what is not each of they should just simply mm -hmm. what do you think of the thought that they should just simply give each individual some kind of way to rank it or you want to crowdsource fact checking yes. basically. What do you think on those? What do you think? Would that work? Facebook already does try to fit Facebook allows you to flag a post as false. So flagging it is one thing, but actually, so, you know, upvoting it of sorts. Yeah, that but, yeah so I think the issue will be then who are you and why do you uh, have the, uh, let's say, the relative merit to do it as opposed to someone else? I, I think it's a complex thing. I mean, I, I don't know if it's, it's that It's just the numbers. The higher it goes. Yeah, so then you're saying that the, the, the accuracy of the, ish, the thing doesn't matter, the number of people who vote to say that it's accurate matters. Yeah. I, I don't think Thank that. Thank you everyone. Works. We absolutely have to go now. That is not fake news.